Um, I have a few like kind of conceptual slides and then in the middle a few technical slides, which I hope um, you can bear with me. And then again, some, some nice results. And um, I hope that even, uh, so I hope at least the first and third part will be clear. And also I hope that most of you will, um, will be with me in the second part. So um, let, let me dive right in. So um, okay. So um, a lot of recent papers are about this correspondence between um, finite deep neural networks and Gaussian processes. And um, the idea is that um, as uh, the net, the 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 width of the finite DNN goes to infinity, uh, the network outputs converge to a Gaussian process. So here we, we have like a fully connected architecture. So uh, this would mean that the, the number of hidden uh, nodes and the number of yellow circles here would go to infinity. And when that happens, then the outputs of, of the network would converge to a Gaussian process. This could happen in mainly two ways. Um, the first is called the NNGP correspondence. That's when we just, uh, we don't train the network, we just sample random uh, weights. And that, that induces a distribution over the, the network outputs. And uh, this distribution converges to GP as the weight goes to infinity. The other correspondence is, called, is known as the NTK, the neural tangent kernel. That happens when we um, train the network with, um, uh, small learning rates and uh, no noise. And then also um, this uh, correspond to some GP with some different kernel known as the NTK. So this is all nice because uh, while um, um, finite DNNs are, we all know have these, all these amazing abilities and do these amazing, amazing things, we, we're kind of having a hard time, you know, having, uh, getting an analytical handle on them. And these GPs, on the other hand, uh, are kind of very, uh, we have a very good analytical handle on them. And we have, you know, uh, we know their, uh, also their, um, uh, their error bars, their, their posterior uh, variants, but um, um, they, they have some drawbacks and uh, which, I, which I'll discuss in the next slides. Um, so um, the, main, the main issue, which is basically, I think behind most of the, things I'll, I'll discuss next is this thing of, of feature learning. So um, finite DNNs, when, when they're trained, their uh, uh, rep hidden representations respond to the data that, uh, that, that the model sees. And um, as a consequence, the, the features, the hidden features change in, in response to the model. So here we see the first layer of AlexNet, I think. So these are the kind of Gabor-like features that the network has, has learned after it's been, is it being trained. In contrast, GPs are uh, kernel methods um, which have fixed fixed kernel. That's uh, just a function of um, sorry, just a function of the network architecture, um, and not um, and not of oh, come on, and not of um, the the data that the net network uh, has seen. Sorry, uh, computer response there. So, um, um, so there's a gap here, which which uh, several people try to to bridge over. So um, let me just mention a few more like uh, qualitative gaps that exist. So one is that this feature learning allows for transfer learning, meaning that uh, once the finite network has seen a bunch of data, it has been trained. We can take throw away the just the readout weights, and then train, retrain uh, read the weights of a new model on a different task. And uh, in many cases, it, it performs quite well. And this is, so this is known as transfer learning and it's completely you know, irrelevant for, for uh, kernel methods um, in GPs. And um, kernel methods have this complexity issue where uh, you know, we need to invert this large matrix, the large kernel matrix, which is this, uh, that has the dimension of the training set size. And uh, for huge data sets like ImageNet, this is, could be an issue. There's various tricks of you know, sparse GPs and so forth, but uh, this, this is an issue for, um, for, for kernel methods. 
And um, in terms of performance, this um, paper from uh, Roman Novak and colleagues from, from Google um, shows kind of a, a persistent um, performance gap. This is training uh, uh, different uh, architectures on, on CFR 10. So we see that as we move from this, you know, um, the least constrained architectures of fully connected networks towards the CNNs, then there is some, um, uh, we see that there's a performance gap in the, for the CNNs with and without pooling uh, between the finite uh, DNN in, in the blue curve and uh, the, the corresponding GP in the red curve. And uh, one might say, okay, so even if we, we, if we have pooling, then the performance gap on the far right is only like 6%. You might say, okay, that's not a huge gap, but still, um, you know, they, uh, you know the, the both models get like around 80%. Um, they could be the way they could be wrong. Uh, it could be quite different, you know, like kind of an Anna Karenina principle that you know, if if, if they both get like only eighty percent, then they, they could be wrong in in quite different ways. Um, so there seems to be kind of a, a persistent gap between these two models. And uh, on specific kind of perhaps more esoteric task, there's a, a, a very large gap. So. Uh, Amit Daniel and Ram Malach showed that on classifying uh, parity of endless digits, there's a very large gap between, uh, the, so the blue curve is, is a finite network and the rest are kind of parallel methods. And Maria Raffinetti uh, and colleagues showed that on um, classifying high dimensional Gaussians, there's also uh, a very large gap to, uh, in the favor of finite networks. So um, uh, one, uh, approach that people have took, including uh, myself and, and my co-authors, uh, in a, in past uh, work, is um, going in, in direction of perturbation theory. So, the idea is that we can think of GP predictions as um, kind of which which are these known expressions. We can think of them as kind of um, the zeroth order term in some kind of perturbation perturbative uh, expansion. So this is kind of the, the exactly solved model in, a, in physics uh, jargon, like the, you know, the, the, the basic Hamiltonian that we have. Uh, and we want to expand it with some small parameter. So the idea is that the small parameter is one over the width, one over the over-parameterization of the network. And uh, Dan Orbitz, Sho Yaida, and, and Boris Hanin even uh, went so far as to publish a whole textbook around this idea. And then one equation from their textbook is this formidable uh, piece, uh, which just shows the uh, just leading one over width correction to, to Gaussian process um, uh, regression. So, uh, and again, like I said, um, they're, they're not the only ones. Uh, uh, Guy Gouré and Ethan Dyer and Shoyeda in earlier work, and again, myself and others, uh, also kind of had different kind of uh, perturbation theory approach results in this direction. So uh, at least from here, it's, it, I think most people would agree that you know, th these expressions might be elegant in some way, but um, they are kind of hard to interpret perhaps. And um, you know, uh, uh, they're complicated. So that's, that's one issue they have. Um, Another perhaps more important issue is their usefulness or appropriateness of, of using um, perturbation theory in, in the context of relating GPs to finite DNNs. So let me just give a cartoon from physics. So in physics, there's uh, an equation known as the Dyson equation relating um, the uh, dressed propagator of some say electron, there's, that's this G, this red G, to what's known as the bare uh, propagator, this G sub zero. And that, that's related to uh, through something called the self energy, the sigma term. So that's that's the Dyson equation. These are kind of these are operator valued quantities. So we can um, you know we can uh, pull out G and, and write it in, in this form, and then we would have this overall like uh, inversion. Um, and trying to do kind of perturbation theory on, on this system is is um, kind of overly naive because you would throw out basically a lot of the interesting behavior that the um, that the system had, like the, the fact that it has a pole um, due to this inverse that represents the particle of the electron. 
So in this system, it, it, it's clearly uh, too, too naive to, to do a first order perturbation theory. We do need all these terms, all these higher, um, uh, in this case, on the right, higher uh, Feynman diagrams, basically. We just sum them all up. So that's a cartoon. And I would like to argue that um, it is likely uh, a similar case in, in, in finite DNNs. So we all know that you know, if you have a Taylor expansion of a function, it only works well uh, in a small neighborhood of that function. And uh, depending on the function, it can rapidly, the, the, the approximation, even, even if you take several um, terms in the, in the Taylor expansion, it could rapidly diverge um, sufficiently so in a sufficiently large neighborhood. So um, uh, one figure, again, from, uh, from the group at Google, showed that um, as you increase the uh, training set size, so here, if we go from uh, blue, which is a small data set, to red, which is a larger data set, uh, we, we see that um, on the x-axis, we have the, the width of the finite network, and on the, the y-axis, the, basically the discrepancy between the predictions of the finite DNN and the GP. And we see that as the data set size grows, the, the, the slope of this discrepancy uh, flattens out. So we need more, uh, we need wider and wider networks to approach kind of the, 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 the to approach basically the GP limit. So as the data set grows, data set size grows, um, uh, basically first order, order perturbation theory becomes more and more uh, inadequate. Um, so what we suggest is a non-perturbative approach. We suggest to somehow take all of the orders into account if possible. Okay, so this kind of concludes my, uh, the first the kind of uh, uh, sketchy part of the talk, like the cartoonish. And now I'm gonna dive in into a few kind of technical slides with equations. So if there's questions up to here, uh, that would be great. And otherwise I'll, I'll go into the details. Great. So, um, okay. So let's um, set, set the stage for, for our uh, framework. We consider um, just uh, vector inputs of dimension D, consider a training set of size uh, small n and uh, scalar, uh, scalar valued um, outputs or uh, labels. So this is like a regression setting. <clears throat> and the single test output, which we test, sorry, input, which we call X star or, or sometimes X uh, n plus one. We pack, we pack all of these into a single vector uh, F, which lives in R to the n plus one. We uh, perform um, uh, uh, noisy uh, gradient descent, which and here theta are the just a long vector of all the network parameters, and um, gamma is the weight decay. Um, the gradient is over a full batch of of the training set, so there's no many batches. We we always take a full batch, and um, there's a learning rate eta, and all of the noise again. There's no mini batching. All of the noise comes from like an uh, exterior. Uh, injected Gaussian, white Gaussian noise, which is this psi. So th this is the training dynamics. And this forms a kind of a discrete time Langevin equation. So if uh, one takes the limit where the learning rate uh, goes to zero and the, the time you have to wait uh, goes to infinity, then uh, if, you, if you wait sufficiently long, then the distribution over the parameters theta converges to a um, Gibbs distribution sorry, over the parameters. So, so that's this uh, P of theta. And this distribution um, can be factored into a Gaussian prior, that's the, that's the first term, and a more complicated uh, likelihood that's complicated due to the network architecture um, embodied in this F sub theta and a loss function, this curly L. So here in, in, in weight space or in parameter space, the prior is simple, it's just Gaussian, and the likelihood term, the data term, is, is complicated. So what we do is um, we, uh, we, we go to function space. Um, we integrate over, we sort of build a function and we integrate over the, the parameters, and then we get something, again, that factors into a likelihood term and a, and a 
in a prior term. And here, um, here uh, the likelihood term is the one that's rather simple. So uh, L could be, you know, like if we're going to take it to be a square loss, it's going to be just some simple term, simple term in terms of the of the outputs of the X. But the prior term, the P sub zero of F, that could that's that could be a depending on on the architecture, that could be quite a formidable beast. Okay. So um, we need to define some kind of over parameterization or width parameter. So here we call it this capital C, C because we, we mainly consider, you know, CNN. So C would be the number of channels, which is the thing that goes to infinity in the, in the corresponding GP limit. So the variance of these parameters scales as one over C. Um, so we know that as C go, goes to infinity, um, F, the, the, the outputs would be drawn from a Gaussian process that's kind of well established uh, by many, pa many papers. Uh, the question is what happens for um, a, uh, a finite C? And then uh, this prior the over function space it could potentially be quite complicated. So um, uh, the, the, the papers that did perturbation theory just kind of um, expand this uh, prior into uh, to um, to a leading term of one over C in this in this context, and then they would stop there basically. And um, what we suggest is to somehow incorporate um, all all the higher order terms um, that go into uh, the prior uh, P zero of F. So the way we do it is to um, to uh, uh, characterize p of p sub f of p sub zero of f by this uh, by its cumulant generating function or CGF, which is denoted here by on the right by, by this curly C. So this curly C, the CGF, is basically um, you can think of it as a Fourier transform of uh, of uh, the original uh, of the original uh, prior distribution p, p, p sub zero of f. And what, one other way to characterize it is um, by uh, these sums over uh, increasingly higher order cumulants kappa. Okay, so we're considering a like p sub z, p sub zero of f. F is a vector over the n training points and the single test point. So it's an n, n plus one dimensional vector, and um, the corresponding CGF, this curly C, um, is a function of n plus one um, t variables. And these t variables are kind of Fourier duals of the f's, of the outputs. And, and again, on, on the second line, you can, you can write it uh, in terms of the cumulants of the, um, uh, of, of the statistics of, of, the net, of the network. So you can see from here that um, with this scaling, um, again, I, indeed, as we, if, if one takes the C goes to infinity limit, then uh, the only the only kappa, the only cumulant that um, does not vanish with C is um, the second one, the, the covariance um, or the kernel in, in, in the context of GPs, and all the rest of them would vanish. So that's in the strict C goes to infinity limit, all the all the kappas would vanish and we would only be left with um, uh, with, with, with kappa two. Kappa one, by the way, the mean, is absent because we just assume that um, the distribution is centered, so the, so the mean is zero. So this is, by the way, one way to to prove or to be convinced of the central limit theorem. So at, that as c goes to infinity, only kappa two stays, and all the rest of the kappas go to zero. And if um, so, the Gaussian Gaussian distribution, by the way, is the only distribution that has this property that it has only the first and second cumulants. And all the rest are zero, whereas all other distributions um, have non-zero higher cumulants. So these t variables, these these Fourier uh, duals, actually have uh, you can think of them as, as um, like fluctuating variables. But you can think, but one property that they have is that um, if you uh, on the scale of sigma squared, their mean is just um, the discrepancy between the true label G. And the network out the mean of the network output, this um, mean of f. So these ITs, um, their their mean uh, has this uh, very intuitive uh, 
into in, very intuitive uh, description. So I hope this slide was clear. Um, okay. So uh, in order to make progress, what we do is we do a kind of a saddle point approximation. So what we can do is that if we take a square loss, a, 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 square, a total square loss, then and we plug it into um, the uh, overall um, posterior distribution and we integrate over the Fs, then we get the partition function Z. And since um, uh, introducing the T variables linearizes um, the, um, the, the appropriate term there, then we just get um, that uh, we can perform the integral over the Fs and just be left with integrals over the T. And this, uh, uh, particular form of, of Z is very, suggest very suggestive of using a saddle point approximation because we have, a, we have this high dimensional integral uh, with this uh, action, this curly S. This curly S has basically this form and um, um, physicists working in kind of statistical physics context, this is kind of a very suggestive form to, to use the saddle point approximation, which, which basically says we don't need to actually perform this integral, we can just uh, compute uh, the stationary points of the action and that, that um, those points would be, and evaluate the, the integral there and then um, evaluate the, the, the action there and then that would be the value of the integral in a good approximation. So we expect the, um, uh, the saddle point approximation should hold um, when both the data set is large, um, both C should be larger than one, or like much larger than one. And um, we, we need a data set or a combination of data set and architecture, which is um, stable under changes in the training set. So I mean here stable, not in a, in a kind of precise meaning, not, not a super colloquial meaning, but stable in the sense that chain, small changes in the uh, training um, set cause only small changes in the outputs. So basically, both that the architecture, the model itself is not super sensitive and kind of that the data set itself is um, such that every data point is kind of on equal footing with all other data points, that there's no kind of special ones. So, um, and if, if you take these conditions, then we kind of show a kind of technical uh, condition for when we expect this approximation to, to hold uh, well. And we also kind of, looked at it numerically and we saw that um, uh, the outputs uh, across um, the outputs across the training set if you kind of have an ensemble of different you know um, random seeds and and and, and uh, averaging across the training dynamics then you get this um, rather Gaussian looking uh, distribution over the over the outputs and in later slides I'll show you kind of more convincing uh, numbers that show that it indeed is um, you know the, the fluctuations of the outputs is, are closely closely Gaussian, and um, and, and also in in, uh, in more specific uh, contexts. So once you have that, you can just you know uh, compute the the saddle point equations, which is again just taking the derivative of the action and equating to zero, and you get this uh, very simple looking um, equation. So basically, just um, uh, sigma squared times the this i t. Uh, at the saddle point, so uh, at the saddle board is denoted here by this uh, T bar, is uh, the difference between the, the, the true target G and the derivative of the, the CGF, this curly C. So this, um, uh, if there's questions here, I'd be happy to take them. There's um, a so, question from the chat. Um, yeah. Wallace asks, why do we need the saddle point approximation? Why do we need? Okay, so um, so this is a high dimensional integral where um, uh, S is also a function of this uh, CGFC and C is like a series of powers of T incorporating all higher um, all higher order uh, powers of T. And we we only know the only integral basically we know how to solve is is the Gaussian one, where only we are, where we only have uh, quadratic terms in T. Once we have like high orders power, high order powers in T, then the, the integral is unsolvable uh, directly. So we have to do some kind of approximation. 
good question. Maybe I could also ask, uh, are you yeah. able to capture the sigma going to zero limit, the not the okay. noise in this case? Okay, right. Um, okay, it's a, it's a good question. Um, in, in our experiments, we, um, we didn't uh, check directly like sigma going to zero in the numerics. Um, I, I need to think for a sec, maybe offline, like how sigma go, going to zero would affect um, the, the cell point approximation here, but it's a good question. I, I, I would need to think about it. Um, okay. So can I ask if a question we, also? Sure. Before. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so aren't the conditions under which the saddle point approximation is valid um, the same under which uh, I mean, uh, the perturbation uh, theory? The perturbation. Would be okay. So that I was okay. That's a great question. I was waiting for someone to ask that. I, I was also worried about this. So in perturbation theory, we only we only need um, c like one over c very small. There's nothing to say about um, the size of the data set. In fact, as, as I'll show you, um, when the data set becomes large, the, the, the GP and the, per, the GP approximation or the per, first order perturbation theory become uh, very bad approximations. So it, actually, you know, in, in, in fact, I'll, as I'll show you, C doesn't have to be super large. It, uh, I'll show you that it, even if it's like two or four uh, under you know, specific conditions, the, the theory still uh, works quite well. So yeah, it's okay. Uh, it, so so here the yeah. n much greater than one and c much greater than n is is an R. You don't need both. Is that is that it? No, no I, I do need both. You need both. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I see. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Could I ask okay. actually one more question? Also, um, clarification on the previous work on uh, maybe I'm mistaken, but was the Roberts at all work? Um, also capturing like depth over width corrections or right. integrated depth. Yes. Way. Yes. Actually, there's if I um, it's it's a long book, so if I remember correctly, and if they're in the audience, they can correct me if I'm saying something wrong. But if I remember correctly, they take as their small parameter uh, depth over width. But uh, again, if I'm not mistaken, I don't think they incorporate the data set size as um, as you know uh, controlling the, the smallness of the parameter. But again, as it's a long book, so I may have missed some sections, but as far as I know, that's the case. Um, okay. So that's kind of, you know, you're asking, kind of getting at the point that, you know, uh, realistic settings have both lots of parameters, but also very large data set sizes, right? Um, so we have a strong feeling that uh, when both of these uh, things are large, even though, you know, uh, the model is, you know, uh, the model is highly overparameterized. There's much more free parameters than data points are needed to, or, or needed to, to fit the data. But still, um, we, we, we still have a strong feeling that um, first order perturbation theory is kind of inadequate. Um, okay. Any, any more questions? Yeah, also, would it matter what the like feature richness of the training set would be? How would Great. that play into it? Like, you mean if it's a super simple uh, data set that's easy to learn? Yes. Okay, excellent question. Um, yes. Um, I think, okay. So, um, uh, yeah. So, I'll, you'll see in a minute in the experience I showed, but uh, like in, in a one liner, I think that if it's if the data is super simple, or you know, it's it's kind of the ratio of how many data points you have to the complexity of of the data set. So if you have enough, how far are you from enough data to, to learning, sorry, to learning all the details of the data set, basically, right? Um, so in the okay, so let me get back to this when I show you the experiments, and and I'll stress this point. It's, it's a good point. Okay, great. And then I also had just like a clarifying question just for yeah. understanding the equations. Which two things are being paired up as the Fourier transform pairs? So the Fs and the Ts are the jewels. The X and the T? The Fs, the Fs, the, the, Fs. the outputs and the Ts are the jewels. Great. Thank you. Right? Because the, the original distribution is over outputs, it's over Fs, and the their Fourier jewels are the Ts. Okay. 
Thanks. Thanks for the questions. Um, great. So let me, let's just see um, one possible interpretation of these saddle point equations is what we term target shift equations. So again, like I mentioned before, these t's on the scale of, of sigma squared, they're just the uh, g, uh, uh, if we take again c to infinity, then that's just the gp limit. It's gonna be the discrepancy between the, the grand truth and the gp prediction, which is what we have here. And for a finite c, um, finite dnn, what we would get um, uh, from the cell point equations is, is this uh, suggestive form of what we call the, the target shift equation. So it's basically um, on the training set, it's basically, it basically looks exactly the same as, as if we did G, the, the, it would be the discrepancy of GP regression, but not on the original target, uh, but rather on this shifted target G minus uh, delta G. Okay. And this delta G um, is determined uh, itself by this, the, the CGF. So, that, so this is the expression for delta G. So you could plug um, uh, the second equation to the first one, you get like this closed set of self-consistent equations for the discrepancy. And you can, you, you um, in a few slides, I'll show you how you would might solve that in practice. But in principle, um, you have this um, set of self, of, you know, self-consistent equations for the discrepancy, which you, then you can plug back for the, uh, for the target shift. And uh, that's what you have on the training set. And then, and then if you want to do a prediction on a, on a new test point, then you would plug, you need to plug this into this equation, which is kind of similar to the, to the one for the, um, it's basically, basically analogous to the one for the training set, but you know, you don't have, you don't have the grand truth on the test point, obviously. So this is the form it would take. You, you can just get it by introducing um, source terms into the partition function. So this is kind of a very general and compact uh, way to, to present things. Um, the crux of the, of, of the matter is, in, in practice is how do you compute the CGF of, of, of the prior of the, of the network architecture? So this curly C. So basically, as I'll, I'll show you, um, you can compute it exactly with no approximations, um, basically only for architectures which are quadratic in the network parameters, the, the thetas. And anything else is, is in track, like it's not, you would have to resort to some kind of approximation to, to compute. So I'll, I'll show you now uh, one major example, which is indeed quadratic in the weights, uh, which is a, a linear, a linear uh, one hidden layer CNN. And then I'll just briefly mention a, a fully connected work network with, with, um, with quadratic activation that's also quadratic in the weights. And, and then I'll, I'll show you some more results, which are, which, which again need to, um, which will need to resort to more approximations. Okay, so we'll, doubt, we'll spend some time with this um, first, um, first example. Um, okay, so to, again, to, to um, if we wanna kind of get more uh, simpler, simpler um, expressions, we, we, we can resort to one more approximation known as um, the EK or the equivalent kernel. So that happens when basically you have a lot of data points and you have um, non-vanishing noise. You have, you have to have some kind of uh, uh, non-zero non uh, noise sigma. And then you basically, what you do is um, you take the discrete sums that you have over the training set in the original GP um, mean, and you replace it by an integral over the input distribution mu of x. And um, this, you know, uh, uh, k k tilde inverse that you, that you have in the uh, you know in the usual expression, you replace it by this um, this fraction that you have on the on the bottom line, um, which is the you know lambda the lambdas are the eigenvalues of the of the kernel, and um, th this is kind of an uh, you know, a smooth approximation to what GP would do. So it, it holds true when, again, when, when the data set, the training set is very large, basically. So this uh, extra approximation would help us in the, in the following model. So, so let's consider the following as uh, very simple, but still interesting model. So it's a, it's a two layer CNN with a teacher student setting. So, so we have a teacher network and a student network where, where they both have the same 
basic architecture, which is this drawing here. We have um, non-overlapping kind of convolutional windows uh, that span the, 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 the input dimension. And we have weight sharing, the, these blue Ws. Um, and so we have locality and weight sharing. And um, then we just uh, have a linear readout layer. And there, again, there's no nonlinearity, everything is linear. So this thing is, is quadratic in the weight, so we can compute its CGF exactly. So that's one uh, nice property. Um, the other uh, nice properties it has is that it has a clear feature to be learned. So, um, so the, the, the student, and again, the student and teacher have the same basic architecture, only that um, the teacher has some specific number of channels C star, and the student can have a, an arbitrary number of channels C. So um, the, the feature to be learned here is basically the W star of the teacher. Right, so that's kind of the hidden features to be learned. Um, and uh, another um, important property of this model is that um, the the number of teacher parameters is uh, you can kind of use is just n plus s, but the input dimension is n times s. So I didn't say so. Capital N is the number of convolution windows, and capital S is the size of each each uh, con window. So the input dimension is just n times s, which is also then because it's just linear function, it's just the nap, it's the number of linear functions. So if we take, um, so we just took basically an experiment, big N equals uh, s. So um, if we take this number to be also largish, then we can kind of have a kind of a pretty wide regime where the little and the training set size could sit. Um, quite comfortably in the middle between these two extremes. So say, um, you know, if, uh, even if um, uh, S is 10, then you have on the left, you have 20, and then right, you have 100. So you could have like, you know, I don't know, 50 in the middle, which is, you know, kind of, uh, um, it's kind of an interesting enough regime. This is interesting because basically um, the GP would need um, N times S inputs to learn well. Whereas a finite network possibly could need only and on the order of n plus s um, examples to learn well, and this is what we'll see uh, in the next slide. Um, so again, we can reduce uh, alpha here is just the root mean square error of this um, uh, of this setting. These are just X, um, like a shorthand notation, this lambda and this uh, sigma sub n, and then if we write the saddle point equations for this simple model, then we get already quite an interesting uh, equation. So the first um, two terms, which, which I kind of marked is just what you get if it's basically just the GP uh, plus EK approximation uh, plus one over N corrections to EK. So that's this Q term that accounts for, um, for one over little n corrections to, to EK. This middle part, is what you would get uh, if you just did a first order perturbation theory in one over C. And this last part with, with the, the inverse is what you get if you sum basically all the cumulants of the CGF. That's why you get, uh, it's kind of a geometric series. So that's why you get this um, inverse, uh, inverse factor. And this inverse is kind of, um, if you think of it, uh, gives you a pole as a, as, as a function of alpha. So you basically have some alpha, some value where uh, if you plot this, you can, you know, you can solve this equation like graphically, just plot, you know, the identity line that the left-hand side and the curve that describes the right-hand side, when you get the right-hand side has some pole. So that's like a, again, like a qualitative thing you, you only get if you do um, a non-perturbative non -perturbative approach, which you don't get if you just did the, you know, just the leading term. So let me show you um, the results. Um, so if we just take a teacher with uh, C star equals one, so only one channel, um, on, um, uh, on the x-axis, we have the number of channels in, in log scale base two. And on the y-axis, it is basically just that, like the alpha I, I mentioned before, the, the root mean square error. So the dots are the uh, empirical values. And on the left, the solid lines are the predictions of our um, self-consistent theory. 
And we see that um, as the training set size grows, um, the, the, the theory matches uh, the experiment increasingly well, right? So the, the solid line matches the dots uh, better and better. And uh, with respect to the question I was asked before, um, so here we, we scale S uh, the size of the, the conv window, which is also you know, related to the size of the input together with the training set size. So basically the, as we increase, increase the, the training set size, the, the task remains kind of equally or relatively equally um, as hard. So we get more data points, but we also have like a, uh, a larger input dimension. So it's, it's still hard to learn. It's not like we're flooding the network with, with too much data that it's, you know, it's already saturating. It's always kind of, you know, on the edge. It's, 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 um, it's, it, it needs more, it still would like to have more data points to, to it could learn more from, from more data points. So I hope that answers that question. And on the right, what we have in this, these dash lines is the um, predictions of just first order perturbation theory. And we see that they work well only when C is very large and, uh, and the training set size is quite small. So it, if C uh, is too small or, or N is too large, then you see that these curves rapidly uh, diverge and, uh, fr from the empirical values. So here is kind of a crisp example where um, you have to have uh, the, these non-perturbative corrections and a first order perturbation theory is, is just inadequate and at least you know, in part of this regime. So any questions up to here? Okay. So um, in this model, we also observed um, a kind of a feature learning phase transition. So what we did is you can take uh, the learned um, Ws that the, the, of the student, uh, the learned uh, filters um, of the student and put them in this uh, W matrix, which is S by C, and then uh, look at the empirical covariance matrix, this sigma sub W. And um, a paper by Martin Mahoney from, from 2021 did exactly this uh, basically for a quite, um, uh, quite a state, I think it was one of the state of the art uh, like architectures, or I think like ResNets or something like this. Uh, so like a very uh, complicated architecture, but they basically did uh, what we did here and they observed this phenomenon. They basically observed a kind of uh, Marchenko Pasteur bulk on the left and a few outliers uh, that left that exited the bulk. So this is kind of, you know, you could model this as kind of a spike Marchenko Pasteur distribution. Um, and uh, if you, uh, obviously, if you would just look at the, um, at the weights at the beginning of training, uh, before they were trained, you just get the, just get the bulk, you won't get the outliers. The outliers are kind of the result of learning something, of, of probably of learning some kind of features. So if you do the exact same procedure in, in this simple uh, toy model, then you get a similar picture. Again, the C star of the teacher is, is one, so we only get one outlier. And uh, in different colors, we see uh, how, how it looks like for um, different values of C, the, the number of channels. And we see that as for, for the smallest value of C we see here, which is 256 in blue, we see that um, this outlier, this blue bar exits uh, the bulk. Um, so we, uh, we, uh, you, you can think of this as kind of a, a phase transition that where you know where if you have an outlier exiting the the noise the, the the bulk of the noise, then when that happens, that is a phase transition uh, between um, feature learning and a non-feature learning issue. So this this uh, when you do have an outlier, um, then its corresponding eigenvector uh, would have a high overlap, it would align well with the corresponding um, W star of the teacher. And we can also, um, on the right here, we can also predict the, the exact location of the space transition, which is also, uh, which also matches quite well the, the experiments. Uh, questions? Um, okay. So let me just mention quite briefly. So again, uh, another, model we can solve exactly this is this quadratic fully connected network also uh, it was considered by the group of uh, Lenka's Deborova and um, 
so there's there's not the the outputs are fixed they're not learned so it's kind of a you can think of it as kind of a naive uh, I don't know uh, global average pooling so only the on the first layer weights are learned and because they have quadratic activation then again the um, the the CGF would be quadratic in the weight so again we could um, compute um, the CGF and hence the uh, saddle point equations exactly and um, here. Like, okay, so in the CNN, we have some kind of symmetry, this uh, weight sharing symmetry or constraint. And we have a different constraint, which is that the first term is non negative. So, this property, the, this non negativity, is completely overlooked by the corresponding GP of this architecture. So, here uh, M is the, just the num number of hidden uh, neurons. When that goes to infinity, you get the GP, and this GP completely misses out on this property. Uh, here we can we, we did kind of a direct solution without going to ek, and um, we uh, recovered um, a, a known like a known property that this um, model has that it has a, a, a kind of a threshold at um, n equals two d with d is the input where then the, the MSC just goes to zero. So just briefly mentioning another nonlinear model where a theory applies to. So let me just for uh, towards the end uh, mention a few more examples of kind of more complicated models where we kind of you know try to test our theory, and then I'll I'll uh, conclude. So if there's more questions here, maybe that would also be a good place to ask. Just a quick question on the uh, quadratic network. So it's quadratic in the weights, and you you say this is exactly computable because basically you can do an appropriate shift of variables and integrate over the Ws or something like that. It's just that um, 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 if if the, you're asking why why is it the case that in this case is 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 solvably exactly solvable? Yes. So um, all right. Um, so, okay. So basically, um, uh, I would need to re relook, have another look at the derivation. But um, we, we actually, when we started doing this, uh, we didn't look, I'll tell you like, like how we got to this, but when we started doing this, we didn't compute directly the CGF. I, I spent you know, some time and a lot of coffee uh, trying to compute you know, the fourth cumulant of some architectures and then trying to do the sixth cumulant and then trying to find some pattern. And then I found out that um, you could just write the CGF. Okay, and then that, uh, you know, that encodes all the cumulants. Yes. So um, basically what if, when you write these things out um, somewhere along the way, uh, if you have, if you have uh, a CGF which is quadratic in the weight, then you can compute the integral exactly. So it would be some kind of Gaussian integral you can do exactly and yes, yes. get some other powers of the weights, then that's not possible. Right. So you so you can this given this quadratic this quadratic term, you can shift the Gaussian in in the weight prior uh, appropriately, such that you can just do the calculation. Um, I think I see. I, okay. I think that's right. But maybe you can do it offline if you're interested. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Okay. Great. Thanks for the question. Okay. So um, okay. So let me again mention like uh, more and more complicated models, which we have less exact results, but you know some some kind of uh, encouraging results. So. Um, Zohar in, in, in Barcelosi recently uh, posted like a, a kind of an extension of this, uh, of this direction on um, more complicated uh, architectures. Basically, one is exactly the same as I showed before, only that now there's a nonlinearity. They, they took an error function nonlinearity um, because it has some nice properties in terms of its kernel. And what they found is, again, these alphas are the same as before. That's the kind of the MSC. And uh, basically, you, you can, if you just look at the numbers, you see that uh, the prediction, alpha prediction is the prediction of, our, of the self-consistent theory. And alpha experiment is um, the, what, what they got, the, the, the empirical values. And you see that the, uh, and alpha C goes to infinity is the GP values. And you see basically that um, the self-consistent theory matches the, the data much, much better. And uh, another thing they did is they looked also at uh, deeper CNN. So basically more, more of these uh, layers of, these, of this kind of architecture. So basically there, um, again, it's, uh, it's their work. I, I was involved only partially, 
So um, I'll just give you like a one-liner. Um, basically, what you, you need to do some some more tricks. So you need to um, kind of uh, uh, separate the, the different layers if, it, if you have more layers. And uh, if you have a nonlinearity, then also there's again, some other manipulations or approximations that you need to do, which I, I will, won't get into at this point. But um, it's, I, I'm ju I just wanted to get, you know, to give a, an optimistic message that it's, it seems possible to extend it, this theory into to more um, realistic architectures. And then one other um, thing I want to mention is that we also looked at this architecture. Uh, this is known as Myrtle 5. Uh, it's a CNN that, uh, that we trained on CIFAR 10. Um, and here we, we just, you know, it's kind of a sanity check um, to, to check the, that, you know, the, the assumptions of, of, of the uh, derivation the theory uh, hold. And here, um, what we saw is that this delta test is just the discrepancy uh, between the prediction of, um, of, of the network outputs re, uh, relative to GP predictions on the test set. And this column, this, this ratio of these kappas, so this kappa four is just the, you know, the fourth cumulant. And um, uh, we just looked at the ratio between that of the CNN of the outputs and that of the Gaussian. And um, if, if we get something that's close to one, then that means it's, it's close to a Gaussian. So other than this um, n equals 64, uh, which is on the last line, all the rest, which we're not sure how to explain now, but all the rest of, of them are pretty close to, to being Gaussian. But if you just look at the, look at the three uh, middle lines of n equals 32 and, and c varies, then you see that uh, the, the ratio of the kappas stays close to one, whereas as you decrease c, moving away from the GP limit, um, the, um, the discrepancy between the network output and GP uh, gets larger. So that means that, you know, the GP and probably also like first order prohibition theory would not be uh, very precise. Uh, but if we could apply our theory here, then um, that we have good, re you know, we, we were optimistic that we could get a better uh, fits to, to what the network is doing. So, um, let me just summarize and then I would be happy to take questions. So um, there's a qualitative gap between finite DNNs and uh, GPs, and we think it's unlikely to be bridged by a perturbative approach. Um, we propose a non perturbative approach that accounts for strong finite width effects. Um, this could correspond to, um, you know, one way to interpret it is a modified GP regression with a shifted target. So that's kind of something that just comes out of the equations. We validated this theory on a few simple architectures and data sets, and we showed some supporting evidence for its validity, and um, that is near Gaussian fluctuations on more uh, realistic data sets and architectures. And we think this is only the beginning. So there's, we think there's much more to be done here in this, in this direction. So uh, that's what I have, and I'll be very happy to, to take questions. Thank you, Gadi, for the uh, very interesting talk. Um, I have a question about approximation schemes. Um, so uh, in, your, in your CGF, I followed a little bit of the calculation and you pointed out these cases where it can be computed exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, could, could you just comment generally on whether you've thought about different cases in which there might be approximation schemes for computing it? So for Great. example, the, yeah. the weights are absolutely crucial here. And in some architectures, weight variances play a role of an effective cutoff or something like that. So you might, Try to imagine doing like a p over lambda expansion or something. Um, what what do you mean by p over lambda? Uh, yeah, so lambda is some effective cut of, cut off related oh, to variance, mm -hmm. and p is momentum. So so some sort of low energy, some sort of approximation corresponding to a low. Momentum. Yes, definitely. So I I haven't done this um, personally. I'm sure that uh, Zoal has some ideas in this direction. Yeah, we're definitely uh, thinking of, about uh, different different ways which you can 
do this, you know, compute the CGF uh, in some kind of approximate way? Yeah, it's a great question, and it's one of the things we're thinking about. So, in your original work, there's uh, it was, there's the exact result, but not sort of systematic looks at new approximations. Right. So again, there's this um, paper by Zoll and Ba. They they, um, they did um, some stuff that I'm not very um, good with the details there. Um, some of it may be um, like similar in spirit to what, what you're suggesting, um, but I definitely, yeah, I, I definitely think that uh, it, it might be possible what you're suggesting in, in some conditions, but I, I haven't done it myself. Great, Great talk, thank you. Thanks. I have, I have a, a quick question. question. Oh, Sven, go ahead. So, uh, thanks. Um, yeah, on the phase transition, uh, part. Um, can you comment a little bit more? So that you had basically the dependence of this phase transition appearing in terms of C or not? I think if right. I remember. Um, sh should I go back to that slide? Yes. Yeah, that would be right. great. Right. Um, okay. So let me. Um, since you asked about it, uh, I just wanted to be on time, so I. Um, uh, let me. Okay. So first of all, one point that I may have failed to mention is that, um, um, <clears throat> like. The self the self consistent equation is for um, the ensemble of average, right? It's for the ensemble averaged uh, predictions. So ensemble here, practically in our numerics, it means averaging over random seeds and uh, over the the dynamics once you, once you reach equilibrium. So you have basically this you have something like this quite long burn in that may be quite long, and once you reach equilibrium, you average over that, and then um, this averaging gives you the ensemble averaged um, outputs. And in that um, uh, phase transition slide, what, what we have there is the, um, is in order to get these statistic, statistics, I collected uh, snapshots in different times and different seeds of the weights, right? And then I uh, put that into a big bag and then I computed um, I, com I computed the uh, eigenvalues of that. Okay, so so there, there's no ensemble of averaging. Okay, um, there's like I, I collect statistics, but I don't do the averaging. So in terms of uh, your question, let me just go to that. So let me go to that slide. Um, so right. So I'm I'm not sure. Let me. Um, I'm not sure that you uh, and I'm answering your question, but let me uh, try. Um, so when you change C, actually, um, it's quite different from a maybe more usual setting because when you change C, you change both the value of the potential outlier and the shape of the bulk. Specifically, it supports the it's it's right and left uh, um, extremes. So when you change C, um, let me. Let me show my screen again. Um, wait, do you, do you see my screen still? Um, we see now the full screen, I think, and with the title. Oh, I see. Uh, okay, let me, be... let me try. Yeah. Anyway, so so when you change C, you change, like, like I said, um, you, you change both the position. Uh, so as, as C uh, becomes smaller, then the outlier wants to come out of the bulk, but also you change um, the shape of the bulk. Uh, let me so let me get there. Is that you? Were you? Sorry, I, maybe I you know maybe you asked. I answered something you didn't mean, but let, could you um, re repeat your question? Yeah, let me see. Can you see, show the slide again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, so, um, I. I I'm waiting for a new laptop. There's a, there's a global uh, shortage in, in silicon, right? So, um, yeah, I'm waiting, waiting for it to respond. <laughs> okay, yeah. Okay, yes. So could, could you ask the question? What, what's, uh, um, 
Yes, so so there's so actually I think two questions. So one is on yeah. the diagnostic side. Um, uh -huh. So basically, I think just uh, to be, to be clear, right? So you're basically uh, looking at the spectrum here, the respectively a spectral density, in order to see make this as a diagnostic tool of whether there is a phase transition happening or not. Um, yes, that's one way to think of it. Um, and so the other one is uh, this, yeah, so exactly that, that, that part uh, where you have this dashed line in the, in the last plot. Um, right. So how, so how, how, do you, how, we, how do we get this dashed line? Yeah, so exactly, yeah. So in some sense, so, okay, you, I guess you said some, some, some cutoff to, to distinguish between these, these two regimes. Um, right. But uh, so, yeah, it's, a, it's a some understanding of, you know, why, what sets empirically, right? This, this uh, it depends on C, as you say, right? Okay, there's this function. Uh, so what, what sets this effectively? Like, how can I understand right. okay, so. that, the, the, that I go between these two regimes effectively, right? Right, so, so here, okay, so, I, I hope I understood correctly. If I if I didn't, then then please ask again, and I'll try. So um, so here we define like in this context and in, in this right plot, we define lazy and feature regimes by just um, the existence of an outlier outside the bulk, yes or no. So if it's outside the bulk, we say it's a feature regime, and if it's inside the bulk, we say it's a lazy lazy regime. So it's kind of different than how it appears in the literature because like, like in, in, you know, in, in a paper of Chizat, uh, basically lazy feature is not a function of the width, it's a function of the, of the scaling of the parameters. So you can have the same width, but if you scale the parameters differently, then you have either feature, uh, feature, feature regime or lazy, uh, yeah, feature regime or lazy regime. Here, we, the, the scaling is constant and we change C to the width. So the way we uh, derive the uh, theoretical value, this dashed line, is basically we model um, this distribution as, like it's written as a spike merchenko pastor distribution, basically just as, you know, just as a, a, a Wishart matrix plus some uh, rank one um, perturbation, so which is, this rank one is exactly, um, is, is coming from the, uh, feature of the of the teaching of this W star, and indeed, uh, okay. So, like I mentioned here, so 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 the eigenvalue, so the eigenvertex corresponding to this eigenvalue, um, as C goes down, it aligns better and better with uh, W star. So that's kind of also kind of a signature that something that the network is learning something uh, in the future. Does that, um, yes. does that answer your question or if not, then please ask. Yes, okay, great. Yes, yes, thanks. Uh, great, thank you. Yasaman, you wanted to ask? Uh, I have two questions, but I can wait till everybody's asked theirs. Um, are there any other questions? <laughs> um, if not, so I actually kind of missed why Oh, there's a, okay, there's a question from Jamie Simon in the chat. Um, recent work suggests that during training of a finite network, its NTK evolves to align with the training data. Do you think this phenomenon could be studied with your framework? Thanks. Okay. Uh-huh. Um, that's an interesting question. So um, I've also kind of thought about something uh, along that line. Um, so one possible answer is that um, um, I mentioned that one way to kind of interpret the, the saddle point is by a shift to the target. Uh, a different way you can interpret this, this, this uh, same thing is um, by a shift not to the target, but to the kernel itself. So the target is fixed, but the kernel is changing. So, um, um, so this change to the kernel, this shift to the kernel, this delta k, um, I think like at least 
conceptually that could be kind of mapped to this uh, evolution of the of the kernel or the features of this MTK. I, I would also point out that um, the the correspondence is a different one. So in MTK, there's no noise, so um, there would be um, some kind of um, residual dependence on the initial conditions um, that were used. And here, since we are at, you know, we're injecting noise during training all the time, and we're looking at equilibrium, then there's no, you know, there's no um, leftovers from the initial conditions, so we're, we're um, forgetting about them. So, so this alternative um, uh, point of view of, of a shift to the kernel rather than a shift to the target um, is uh, is something that could be related. It's something that we started looking at, but it's you know, computing, um, computing this shift to the kernel is uh, quite, it, it gives you quite um, uh, complicated expressions even for very simple architectures. So, so even for a linear fully connected architecture, if you try to compute this, I, I've done it, but it's, you know, it gives you something reasonable, but it's even for that um, super simple, you know, that simple as it gets, it already gives something um, not super simple, and then if you go to the next uh, more complicated architecture, then you get uh, very, um, very, very, you know, very kind of scary stuff. So um, I, I don't currently see a way that you know you can just look at this um, shift to the kernel and uh, you know look at its you know look at its eigenvectors and say okay these are the features that the network have learned. If we had that. Uh, right now that would be amazing uh, but uh, we we might get there i don't i don't uh, currently have a res such a results report but it's it's a very interesting uh, direction maybe uh two quick questions um yeah uh, before we end uh i kind of missed um in your um framework are you you're only able to when you solve, like, because you need to solve the self-consistent equations, uh, you need to assume particular forms for the target function. You can't drive like a closed form expression um, independent of the target, like for arbitrary target function. Okay, so so for so there's two levels, right? So so for the kind of general equations that I showed, uh, everything is is yeah. like to derive the equations them, themselves. Everything is completely arbitrary the target and and the architecture which, which determines you know the output distribution the cgf that's completely you know up to you there's nothing there there's nothing other than you know the the you know the conditions i, I mentioned um for that are needed for, for the approximation then there everything is completely up to you for um for doing um like more specific to get more, like more specific results, the, the like the ones I showed for this model for this kind of linear CNN teacher student, then um, you know if um, like to get this clean picture which we we see on this slide where there's a clean clear like um, feature of the outlier, then I think it's you know it's uh, it's it's a good idea to to get to, you know to consider like simple like examples like we did like this teacher student setting, of course you can um, also, you know, um, consider like more complicated stuff. And I think it, it would work. It would, I think it would just be a bit more difficult to analyze. But for like conceptually for the, for the equations themselves, you don't need uh, additional assumptions other than the one I said. It's just that if you wanna get simple, like intuitive results, then you should, it's it's a good idea, like pedagogically to do it. And is there um, a condition on the? Can you get a condition on the learning rate for which uh, this regime holds? Great, um, right, excellent. So is um, so right. So I, I guess you're referring to something like uh, like your results on the, on the catapult uh, mechanism, where you have this uh, critical value for for the learning rate. Um, I, I think, I think it's quite different because it, 
uh, I, I, we don't have uh, any specific like, but like clear bound or critical value for that. I think it's also uh, quite different um, than something like the catapult uh, phase, because I think that once you have noise, this additive noise, then I think it it it, I know, it kind of changes things. Um, but yeah, I we 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 did need to like in the experiments we did need sometimes to have quite a small learning rate um, to get uh, that you know the experiment doesn't explode because also in in CNN like you know each each weight uh, has like more bang for your buck. Uh, in terms of uh, you know um, affecting the, the outputs, and then you would do need to to use quite small learning rates so that um, um, it doesn't explode and it's stable. But yeah, I don't have any expression for like a bound that you know the learning rate should be under or something like that. Okay, great. Thanks um, for answering. Okay, thanks. and thank you for okay. the talk. Um, I guess. Okay. We can end there if there are no other questions. Um, let's thank Gadi once again. Okay, thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks Pleasure. a lot. Okay, bye. See you. Good talk. Bye -bye.